in front of the, the, the hospital here, there is the very long rocky ledge which gave us the, the British defenders an extra height advantage. And then in the latter stages of the battle, they managed to take possession of the, the cattle kraal, which is where Evan Jones, we believe, was fighting and then was having to fight with his fists. 22nd of January, 1879. Just after the terrible British defeat at Isandwana, a small garrison of around 150 British soldiers successfully defended this small mission station at Rourke's Drift against over 3,000 Zulu warriors. It was an epic action that was to see 11 Victoria Crosses awarded to this tiny band of brave British soldiers. Stay tuned to the end of this film to find out all about the most controversial but little known aspect of the battle. We'll come back to that. It's a famous engagement, perhaps the most famous in British military history. But it's a battle about which we are still learning and discovering new and fascinating sources. A lot of them are from old newspapers. Um, lots of them are sort of private letters that we sort of just come across, you know, different sort of uh, museums and archive sources uh, around the world. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just basically each day searching through lots of different material and oh, oh there's something new and this one tells a different story so it's just it's then then you can add it all together and then you know it builds that better picture of what actually happened so it must be quite amazing when you suddenly get a call to say a new letter's been found uh, yes e even now even this week i've still been sort of searching and, and found i think two new sort of rocks drift men as and what happened to them so even now sort of 144 years later still searching and trying to find out who they were and how they came to be there. Everyone at the battle had their own unique story and all of those stories matter. Ian Knight, Lee Stevenson and Alan Bainham Jones have just finished a two book series that pulls together all of the old and new accounts. At the moment it includes all the known eyewitness accounts um, of Rourke's Drift survivors both British and Zulu uh, but as I say I say that knowing that more are going to turn up imminently and it sounds like you've already found a couple yeah, already. And there's, yeah there's definitely one more where i know the newspaper and i know the year but i can't find it lee's favorite new discovery is from a young private called caleb wood and it was published in the derbyshire times in 1913. the fighting was fierce during the afternoon but more so after dark we were so pressed on that even evan jones hit out with his fists and let me say, he knew how to use them. When our ammunition began to short, the order was given to use cold steel. We stood back from the wall and received the enemy's charges with the bayonet at the shortened arms, a point which is almost impossible for any man to turn aside, for there is so much weight behind it. This was very well to stop the first ranks, but points from the guard in quick succession was the method we adopted. We were amazed at the determination of the enemy. One of our men said to about half a dozen of us during a calm in the fight, now lads, listen to me. Let us all stand firm where we are. We may as well die on this side of the wall as on the other. That is if we have got to die. I don't think we shall live to see the light of another day, but we may if we stand firm and never mind how many there are trying to get in. I think one of the things that we were very keen to do in the book is to draw out some Zulu perspective on it. Uh, traditionally, that's been kind of overlooked in a lot of conventional histories. Um, it's quite difficult with Rourke's Drift because there are not a lot of Zulu accounts of Rourke's Drift. But there's quite a fun little one here when somebody uh, interviewed Prince Dabulamanzi Khan Panda, who was the Zulu commander during the battle. Uh, and they're always trying to sort of tease information out of him. Unfortunately, uh, not enough from a historian's point of view. Um, but this one just kind of made me smile because uh, I think the prince ends up getting the, the better of this little exchange here. Um, so this is when uh, Prince Dabulamanzi is surrendering towards the end of the war. Uh, and somebody says, when asked by the officer who was bringing him in if he thought the war was over, Dabulamanzi remarked, oh yes, you have beaten us. You had the best guns, but we have the best men. Uh, then after thinking for a few moments, he turned and said, but we'll fight again in two or three years time. An officer of Lonsdale Horse, who had been treating the warrior to champagne, asked him if he would give him some small keepsake, meaning a snuff box, 
or some trifle of that kind. It was some time before he could be made to understand what was wanted, uh, but at length he produced a bag of sovereigns and gravely extracting one, presenting it, saying with pride uh, that he had got them all at his San Joana. So there's a little twist in that, that the guy's scrounging something off him and he's thinking, oh, you can have something back that I took off your men. <laughs> uh, and I think that's just quite a nice little exchange. Brilliant. Was he a bit of a well-known character? Like, was he known as a bit of a joker, a bit of a character? Uh, he, he was certainly a fairly confident and, and sort of expansive personality, yes. And, and he got a lot of fame amongst the British through leading at, uh, at Rorksdrift, to the extent that a lot of British newspaper accounts accredit him with being commanders at all sorts of battles that he wasn't actually present at. Um, so it, it's quite interesting. And, uh, and you get the impression that he sort of enjoyed this, this little bit of notoriety um, towards the end of the war when he was interacting with his former enemies. If you're interested in the battle and love the film Zulu, then there are fascinating objects here at the Clash of Empires exhibition currently taking place at the Royal Philatelic Society. Just follow the link in the description below this video for your free ticket. So obviously you've read these accounts over and over again over the years and you've seen some of the, some of the key participants, their stories change, it starts to differ over the years. Can you give us an, an example of that? You know, if you're used to telling the story, you get used to telling it in a certain way. Um, and one very clear example is the famous Private Hook. Um, who got the Victoria Cross for uh, defending the hospital during the battle. And his first account of it is very jagged and quite kind of traumatic. Uh, he talks about killing a young Zulu who was wounded because he was worried that this guy was still a threat. Uh, and at one point he says he's over the soles of his shoes in blood when he's fighting in the, in the hospital. So he's splashing around in the pools of blood from the dead and dying Zulus. Uh, now later on, those details get dropped um, when he's uh, a doorman at the, um, the British Museum, he's quite often for, asked for his story, uh, and he's got a much more polished kind of tale from beginning to end, takes out a lot of the brutality, uh, and it's just interesting to see how that develops over several consecutive uh, accounts over a number of years. Uh, and I always think as a historian, well, if you only had one of those accounts, you would form quite a different opinion of, of the event and of the man himself. Um, so, yeah, one of the beauties of the book, having a number of accounts, you can at least get to kind of compare them and draw out details from different points. And now for that little bit of controversy that I mentioned in the beginning. The killing of Zulu wounded. Did it happen and if so, why? I think that the reality was uh, the British were in a pretty desperate, desperate situation at the end of that battle. Um, how would they have coped with a large number of Zulus to treat even if they wanted to, but at the point in the war that they were at, they didn't want to. Um, and it's very clear, uh, drawing through these accounts, there's quite a lot of evidence that essentially they went over the field and, and killed off uh, all the wounded Zulus that they found. Uh, and drawing those out, I mean, there were quite a number of accounts that we had to kind of go through to mm. piece it together, didn't we? Yeah, I think it's very much that they were sort of a series of events that, that occurred over, at the end of the battle. Um, they're quite often the sort of people have merged them all together as if it was one single sort of, oh, right, let's go and kill all the Zulus. But I think it was lots of random acts of violence against wounded Zulus, you know, chasing them down on horseback, shooting them as they tried to escape, and then obviously sending um, other soldiers in to kill off the wounded in large numbers where they found them. So it, it clearly it happened. Um, and we've been able to sort of collect all of that information and present it as a, this is exactly what we found, this is what happened. Yeah, we've, we've tried to do it sort of as unsensationally as possible. Obviously, uh, we're aware we're on slightly thin ice. We, we don't want to be seen that we're going in to besmirch the reputation of the heroes of Rockstrift. But this is the reality of, you know, probably most wars and certainly the reality of, of that war. Uh, and I think it's quite important now that it, it is acknowledged and just told as part of the story of the battle, which is very much what we've mm. tried to do, isn't it? Yeah. So guys, that's all from here at the Clash of Empires exhibition for me. I'm going back to South Africa this week, but it is open until the end of the month. So be sure to still get your tickets. You can still come down. It is free. And I just want to say thanks, firstly, to the organizers who have been amazing. Secondly, to the speakers and authors, but most importantly, to everyone here who's come and said hello, who's shook my hand. It's made me feel really involved in the community and that we're at the heart of something interesting here. Because let's face it, in my real life, 
people mock this, they laugh at it, they think, oh, military history, how lame. But actually, to be amongst people who love it, like me, has been absolutely priceless. So I just want to say thanks to everyone who's been here and also everyone who's been watching. It really makes it worthwhile. I think it makes me feel um, like part of something, and I appreciate that.